Hi, I'm Edwin Roach, Director of the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with Suman Ghosh. Uh, thanks, Suman, for uh, joining me for this uh, discussion. Thank you, Edwin. Thanks for uh, speaking to me. It's my pleasure. So let me just introduce you. You're uh, I'm just looking at your, your bio, and your, uh, you have an undergraduate degree from the Indian Institute of Technology and a MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, and you've been working for 22 years, uh, kind of in in high in uh, multinational uh, companies and like Intel, Philips, etc. And you have an uh, interest in leadership development, uh, creative creative problem solving, design thinking, which I I love to. Uh, and uh, emotional intelligence uh, work. So, and the reason we're talking is you just had written a book called Command, From Command to Empathy Using EQ in the Age of Disruption. And so we wanna uh, talk about your book and is there anything else by way of introduction that you'd like to introduce yourself about? Uh, thanks for the, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I think you've kind of covered it. Uh, you've worked for over 20 years. Um, in terms of the kind of jobs that I've held, I used to mostly been in IT and also in consulting prior to that. Um, used to do SAP hands-on consulting with uh, digital, which became part of HP. Uh, then worked with Intel in large program management. Um, I was the delivery head for SAP uh, consumer goods with Cognizant, which is IT service provider. And my last corporate job was with Philips. Uh, all of them in India. Uh, I was the lead for the global delivery for consumer goods. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of my background. And mm -hmm. uh, so this, so being overall a very, you know, boring IT guy, very left brain all throughout. Hey, I so have a, I'm a, I come from a system administration. They had Microsoft back office certification. So Microsoft okay. certified system engineer. So it's one tech guy to another. <laughs> We're moving from the tech into the empathy. So. Yeah, yeah, good to know. Yeah. So this is a complete departure from that. So I've, over the years, as I started working, I got more and more interested in the human dimension, uh, specifically on EQ. And uh, last four years, I've started a company uh, with, with two of my ex-colleagues, and we do leadership development, and we also look at emotional intelligence. Uh, I co-authored this book with uh, my friend Avik, uh, who's also, uh, I knew him from the PricewaterhouseCoopers days. Uh, so Avik and I decided to write this book on EQ. It's, a, it's kind of a relatively new topic, at least in India. Um, and uh, we're very excited uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that we're very fortunate that uh, HarperCollins decided to publish it. Uh, it's good, doing quite, quite well, touch wood. And, uh, it came in the Amazon Best Reads uh, in April of this year. So yeah. Okay. So, so the book is is about. Uh, so you've moved from the high tech into uh, more the uh, EQ emotional intelligence field. So it sounds like you're more became more interested in empathy and and uh, it seems I think the book is more about the connection between empathy and leadership. Right. You're you're looking. Yeah. You're moving from just uh, you know tech work to more. How do you lead? How do you lead a company? How do you uh, lead a startup? So you're going to, and you're making the case that uh, empathy. You know, should you be using an empathic approach? Yes, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, a lot of the book I'm trying to build that case, um, and the, it's called from command to empathy. So what we are arguing in the book is that. Uh, it's important we feel that we need to move towards empathetic style of management, moving away from the command and control style of management, which has been the traditional uh, way of managing. And why is that important in terms of leadership, uh, both from a global perspective as well as from an Indian perspective, is what we've tried to uh, talk about and discuss in the book. Okay. So... Um... The, your, we're, so we want to, before we go into the book, we want to go just you know, chapter by chapter, just hear what, what, uh, what your, what your uh, how you've laid out each chapter and what case you're making. 
So how did, how did you get interested in empathy, just kind of personally? How did you move? So I know that you're saying SAP, and I know SAP, that they've talked a lot about the empathy there at SAP, the, yes. the director, the founder, the CEO. He's always, he, for a while, he was just, you know, having a lot of, you know, saying a lot about empathy. And uh, I see, and I think at the beginning of the book, you mentioned uh, the CEO of uh, Microsoft, who's, I guess, from India as well, and you know he's made it, he's become a big spokesperson for empathy and technology. So, how did you kind of get started or interested in this topic? Um, mostly from the work that I've done as part of my company for leadership development. Uh, so, we believe that uh, leadership needs to be more holistic. You know, typically it focuses a lot on the functional skills, the hard so-called hard skills. So, moving away from there. Uh, we think it's it needs to be more holistic. You know, we we do wellness programs as part of our uh, training programs. We call it the inner self, right? Uh, a leader needs to be calm, happy, energized, and then we also look at what we call the non-cognitive aspects. So, for instance, uh, how do you manage conflict, uh, high performance mindset, all of that, right? So those topics and a lot of them are very related. And there, you know, there's we talk of motivation, compassion, empathy. Uh, emotional intelligence, and a lot of them are pretty interrelated. And the more I studied it, both for the book as well as for my training programs, I realized that probably empathy goes to the core of this whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, emotional intelligence. And I think EQ to me is really a, is the foundation for leadership. Well, that's where we have a lot of resonance. That was sort of my journey as well, kind of looking at these different human values and just mm -hmm. seeing that empathy is sort of this pivotal uh, value, sort of this gateway value to others' uh, values as well. So I see we have a lot of uh, residents. I'm glad, glad to see that's happening in India as well. Uh, uh, so should we go through the chapters? Do you want to kind of give a bit of an outline of the book and we can discuss? Sure, sure. Uh, so. sure. sure. Uh, so essentially the book has uh, eight chapters. Uh, it starts with the foreword, and uh, it's by uh, the foreword was written again. Very, we were very fortunate. It was written by uh, the SAP India President and MD, uh, Mr. Dev Deep Sen Gupta. Uh, as you mentioned, SAP has been in the top ten uh, list of the most empathetic companies, so they're doing quite a bit, both globally as well as in India. Uh, Mr. Sen Gupta has actually put it very nicely, the entire foreword in a couple of pages. I think he has kind of summarized, he's aptly summarized what's really happening out there and why empathy is important. And I'd like to read one paragraph, you know, from that foreword. Okay. But I'll leave it to the end because the, my last chapter talks about empathy and it will fit in perfectly there. Okay. So it starts with the foreword. Uh, then we have a preface which talks about, which kind of summarizes the book in our eight, 10 pages. Um, in terms of uh, you know why we need a more holistic and a more comprehensive framework. Uh, chapter one, uh, we started with the story. One of the things we wanted to do in this book is uh, try to make it uh, more interesting. We, we didn't want it to read like a, a textbook, if you will, because end of the day, the topics are quite heavy. There's a lot to lot to grasp and a lot to. But we wanted it to appeal to a lot of people. You know, people both like. Uh, in the corporate, as well as it has a lot of lot of things which an individual can use because a lot of it appeals to individual skills and uh, competencies. So the first chapter actually starts with a story. The whole chapter is a story, uh, and it's called the rise and fall of Vineet. It just so happens that uh, uh, you know we were me and my uh, co-author Avik, uh, we were having we were in a toy at a popular pub in Bangalore, and we met this gentleman. And, you know, we got chatting and he told us his story. And as he, as, uh, as we're having more and more drinks, he opened up more and more. So it was a very interesting story. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give the story away, uh, but here's what it is in a nutshell. So, uh, and let's call him Vineet. So Vineet basically comes from a, a small town, humble beginnings. You know, his parents basically own a shop, uh, uh, very traditional kind of family. Then he moved to Delhi, he went to college, you know, he really worked hard, burned the midnight oil, his first car, his first job, all of that worked out perfectly well, right? He got married to this lovely girl, they had, they had a child. 
he got another promotion. He, he moved jobs. He came to Bangalore uh, and joined a captive center as an MNC. He, he was on the fast track. He got two promotions uh, in a span of just four years. And everything was growing, going great. He was AVP. And then came the first signs of trouble. Right. And the troubles, and I talk about a lot about, you know, I, the story unfolds in terms of what really happened. Um, there were multiple layers of management. This, this head office was in the US. There were multiple layers of management, but he felt more and more like a team member. Um, the work pressure was unrelenting. It was 24 by seven. Um, he started getting tired, stressed. It started impacting his health. It started impacting his personal life. He tried to do a lot of things in terms of uh, you know, spending more time with his team members and trying to do things with his country manager, building relationships, all of that. But somehow uh, they didn't work for multiple reasons. And then things came to a head and uh, you know, his team also felt a lot of, a lot of challenge. They felt a lot of pressure. And young one, young, one young person challenged him and he got upset and he screamed at that person and he lost his school. HR got involved, and from there, actually, things went uh, uh, pretty bad, pretty south, right? So then we say that, have you really ever felt like Winnie? A lot of people would have, there are, if not fully, but a lot of the places you would feel you could resonate with what, what has happened with Winnie. And this story actually, uh, what, why we have this story is that, to me, it's basically the IQ, I, it's the IQ part which got him to that level of, of AVP, uh, but probably it was a lack of EQ that got him into all this trouble and he had a lot of trouble coming out of it. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying that he had, a, he had a, lot of, a lot of stress, a lot of work pressure, and it was his lack of sort of emotional intelligence and emotional skills that exactly. was uh, keeping him from kind of getting through his uh, stress. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And, um, and the, you know, the, the way we sometimes see our bosses, right, as unreasonable, the team saw Vineet, um, you know, like we see our bosses, right? So Vineet felt, uh, and when we asked him, he, he thought he was a victim of circumstances. And this is typically, this is exactly what happens, right? So this entire story is a lot about, you know, how IQ can help us, uh, but a lack of EQ, um, beyond a certain point can really get us in trouble. And that's why we need to build that skill. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. So if, if uh, you're saying if what I'm hearing is if you don't have emotional intelligence that, uh, that uh, you can, ha you need that to kind of work through these problems and otherwise you can kind of go into stress and kind of have a lot of negative consequences. Yes. And I think, IQ initially helps as you know for academic success even for initial work life uh, initial part of the career but as one goes up the ladder I think EQ becomes more important and that that becomes very evident in the story okay. yeah uh, the second chapter is about um, we, we call it mission EQ call for action here again there is a story about Rajesh and Swati and this is a story that was, uh, which actually was about my friend. Uh, this friend of mine actually went to her boss uh, with a request for leave. And her boss was actually handling an escalation. So he gave a pretty standard response. And I'll not tell you what the response was, but it was a pretty standard one, which is what we would typically say. But there was a difference. The, it was not a standard kind of situation because my, my friend had actually uh, was very distressed. She was under a lot of, uh, um, you know, she was very disturbed because she had just heard that her mother was very take, taken in very sick and she was hospitalized. Um, so what happened is that uh, she's, uh, my, the boss said something which she did not like at all. And then um, she came back to work, but after that things were never really um, good between uh, between them and things just became, went from bad to worse and within a year she, she left the company. So what happens is that uh, we don't realize sometimes our words and gestures have a huge, a very powerful impact on the people that we interact with. Um, a single incident can create this sort of rupture uh, from which we may not uh, fully recover. And that's exactly what happened here. So managing emotions uh, is very critical. Okay, so you're talking about two different stories of people who have had kind of interpersonal problems, right? They got work stress and so forth, 
but they're just having difficulty relating uh, and with someone in a work environment and that's causing kind of negative consequences for them. Yeah. Yes. And, and so it's important to be able, oh, it's, so it's important what I'm hearing is it's important to be able to, to, to relate to people in an effective way. Yes, absolutely. It's important and it's important to be sensitive to this. It's, it's, it's not okay uh, because what happened here is when the boss was uh, asked later on, uh, he gave a reason saying that, hey, I was also in a lot of pressure uh, because I had I had an escalation going on at that point. Uh, but, you know, do circumstances give one excuse uh, to be less empathetic? That's the point. And I think no, because it doesn't matter. It's not multiple interactions. Even that one interaction can be, um, you know, can be critical. So one has to be sensitive irrespective of what's happening around us. Uh, you know, recently I was talking to somebody and a friend of mine, um, he said, hey, you know what, I, I understand this empathy is important, but you know what happens is at work, I'm so busy, I, I just don't get time to implement any of that. Right? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering that, uh, and a lot of people feel that way. So uh, I think it's, it's not about doing empathy only when you know, you're relaxed and you know, uh, when there's not much pressure. No, it, 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 one has to be empathetic throughout. Uh, that's the point. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that these interactions, these interpersonal interactions that were problematic could have been addressed with empathy. If the, if the people had been more empathic, they could have worked through their uh, personal issues better or their relationship better. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, then there's another story. Okay, so one, what I'm saying is, okay, we need to be empathetic. Um, then there's another story which I which happened to me when I was in my job with LG Group uh, in South Korea, and uh, I had an issue, and it was uh, it also had to do with the cultural differences, uh, and I took it to my bosses, one of the bosses that I had there, and he said, yeah, he heard me out. He said, Suman, I hear you. We need to fix this. And I came back from the meeting feeling good about it, saying that okay, maybe you know now now it will get resolved but nothing much really happened. Um, then I spoke to a few other colleagues and then that, that's when I learned that uh, they, they, weren't, they weren't also expecting much to happen. So for this particular boss, it was merely his way of uh, diffusing an immediate concern, you know, by sounding very empathetic. So the point I'm trying to make is it, it goes beyond just listening skills. You can be compassionate, you could have listening, all that is fine, but it requires a particular mindset which, uh, uh, which is about openness and all that, but it also requires action because only then the trust gets built. So EQ is not really just about, uh, you know, listening with empathy because if I listen, but I don't do anything about what you're telling me, uh, I, I, that, that becomes futile after a while. Mm, so you're, you're feeling there needs to be some kind of an action after the listening, that if you have a relationship that you listen to each other, but there's some kind of a shared action uh, that, I don't know if it's shared, but there's an action that happens af after that, uh, that dialogue and that listening. Action, at, at least the communication. So if, if, if I listen to you, Edwin, and, I, and there's a problem, I try to resolve it. If I'm not able to resolve it, at least I should have a, a chat with you in terms of, okay, what are the impediments I'm facing? And why is it that I'm not able to do or whatever I'm doing, right? So, so some closure to that extent. Okay. Uh, so some sense of agreement or some yeah. mutual understanding that comes right. out of it. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. Um, then I've given um, quite a few examples in the book. Um, some local examples. There's this gentleman uh, who was the CEO of a company called housing.com. And... Uh, one of those whiz kids, he did phenomenally well, but the board fired him saying his behavior was not befitting of a CEO, right? IQ was very high, but he lacked empathy, impulse control, reflectiveness, all of that. And we're seeing more and more examples like that, both globally as well as in India, where uh, lack of EQ um, is actually creating a lot of problems. And uh, then I actually talk about uh, a very nice uh, framework, uh, which is the ACR matrix, which is the active constructive responding. Um, I really like this one. Uh, research has shown, research done with couples have shown that, uh, you know, 
when when spouses help each other during good times that sort really builds trust and empathy so it's not really about trying to do things during bad times but it's also about it's what is more important is how we uh, relate to each other during good times and i think this is very true in, in the corporate world as well you know we try to kind of jump in and and uh, and firefight when there's a problem but i think the real time to do the build that connection is when things are good Mm, so have uh, empathy training, empathy practice, sort of ongoing before the conflict, any yes. conflict happens. So be sure right. to bring that in uh, right. just in the normal relationship, be it sounds like in a, in a family relationship or in a business relationships as well. Yeah. Yes, I think in both. Yeah, because, by that, because only in those times you would have built the trust and the, and the connection. Uh, which will help us in kind of resolving that conflict. Do you go into uh, how to go about doing that? With the like, what is the pro or you mentioned some process? I didn't. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that one. But is there some empathy building? Uh, is that later in the book, or is that when does that come in? No, like, the how I to talk about in the, the in that chapter is in the second chapters only. Um, it's called the, it's the, the framework is the ACR framework, active constructive responding. What it is essentially is, is, is a two by two framework where uh, on one angle, on one axis, you're, it's all about how we communicate, right? Uh, whether, it's, whether it's destructive or constructive. And the other axis is about, um, uh, sorry, what we communicate. The other one is about how we communicate. Is it, is it active or is it passive? So that gives us four quadrants. And I've given examples of, you know, how we typically communicate and where it falls on those four quadrants. And the only quadrant which actually builds empathy is uh, uh, in the, the active constructive, where it's not passive, it's active, but, and it's also not destructive, it's constructive. So that's the quadrant which really builds empathy. And so I've explained that with, with uh, a few examples as to how that framework works. Uh, do you I have do an example of that? Like uh, how... How, how would you teach someone? What would they do to uh, learn those skills? Like what's... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh -huh. um, so let's say, um, so let's say if, uh, somebody, a, a colleague comes and says, hey, you know what? Uh, I just got the promotion, right? Um, so there could be multiple ways I actually respond to, to what that person is saying. So let's look at each of the quadrants. So let's say if I say, Oh, okay. I'm, I say I'm still working and I don't even look up and say, hey, okay, fine. Good for you. Right. So what I've said, what I've said is not destructive. It's constructive, but it's not active. It's very passive. Right. And the person doesn't feel so good about it. I could also say, um, you know what? Hey, uh, you got a promotion. Hey, let me tell, tell you about my promotion. What happened? Right. So that, that, that is actually, uh, I'm actually hijacking the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, it is, it is passive and it's also destructive because the person doesn't feel the connection. And a lot of people, actually, a lot of times we end up doing that, not realizing that we're stealing the thunder. We make it about ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we, we, we kind of hijack the conversation. Okay. The yeah. first one, the first one then is like not bringing your full presence to the person, yeah. right? You're, you're sort of like keep withdrawn. You're not fully present and being with the person. The second yeah. one is you're sort of changing the topic about the person celebrating their promotion or whatever to being about you. So you're sort of like putting the attention back on to you. It's, right, okay. right. I mean, it's not that I'm doing it with, with any mal intent. It's just that uh, I'm so happy to be talking about myself without realizing I may be hijacking the conversation and making it about myself. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's not building. It doesn't help in building the empathy. Right. Uh, Our it's, would be, mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to build a, a deep relationship, a deep yes. empathic relationship, and how how do we build that? And just being, you know, bring part of it's going to be bringing your full presence, and the second yes. part is is uh, you know not making it just about you, but being able to hear the other person and be present with them for wherever they're going to until they feel heard and seen and. Right, yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the other one could be what is active and destructive. So that is, you know, it's like saying, uh, hey, do you know, uh, 
are you sure you want this promotion? Do you know what it, what it entails? Do you know the kind of work that you, the amount of traveling you have to do? So essentially, uh, you're putting doubt in the other person's mind almost, mm -hmm. right? So, and the person starts wondering, hey, why did I even share this with this person? Why did I share this information, right? Um, so it's like a you, it's like a joy thief, you know. You, you you're stealing uh, the the joy. And mm -hmm. what is really the only quadrant that works is that when we are active and we are also constructive. Hey, hey, that's really great. Tell me more about it. You know, when we go out and uh, have a have a cup of coffee, tell me more about it. And just be in a listening mode. Mm -hmm. That's what builds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So to build a relation, to build an empathic relationship, listening. Uh, yeah. and kind of letting the person fully express themselves and kind of feel into their experience. And, and that's going to help build uh, that uh, relationship and make the right. person feel good. Like they're. Makes them feel good. About exactly. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Care about. Okay. And of course it, it, it also has to stem at some level. It has to be about, there has to be genuine interest in that person. You know, one is not trying to fake it. It's really about genuine interest. Uh, and that's what builds the empathy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was uh, chapter two. And then um, going into chapter three, um, I start building a case of why EQ. So the chapter is called Emotional Enablement. It's about time. The reason why I wanted to focus a lot more, a lot on this is uh, I feel there's still, uh, and when I say I, is essentially I'm talking about on behalf of my co-author as well. Uh, we feel that, and we felt this, especially in the Indian context, that sometimes people are not even sure whether empathy is the right thing or the AQ is the right thing, because there's such a strong command and control influence, right? Um, I have conversations like, hey, but w w why is it important? Or... Uh, wouldn't I be seen as weak if I show you em empathy? Um, so, so before we start talking about the how of empathy, we need to talk about the why of empathy. People need to be convinced that yes, empathy is the way to go. Right. And I've argued it from different angles. So just to uh, give you a quick idea about some of the different ones. So first from an external angle. So there's this nice framework which I've talked about, which is called, which was done by Gary Hamill. He talks about, uh, you know, the, the hierarchy of employee traits. So essentially what he's arguing is it started with the industrial economy and then it went to the knowledge economy and now we're moving to a creative economy. And the traits that are required in each one of them is different. So first it was about obedience, diligence, diligence, then intellect, of course, intellect for the knowledge economy. But as you move to the creative economy, it becomes more about passion and creativity and things like that, right? So that's one of the reasons we are why we feel EQ is becoming important. Mm -hmm. Certain external factors are also at play. Some big ones, for instance, social media. Like social media today, in anything happens, any part of the world, people get to know almost immediately, right? So, you know, individuals can't hide, uh, neither, can, neither can companies. Uh, people are not just interested in what products you make. They want to know about how you make it. Is it ethical? Is it sustainable? Is it humane? All of those things, which, which actually is more about EQ than IQ. Uh, then there's globalization, right? So if I'm a manager sitting in India, um, you know, my manager could be somewhere in Australia or I may have a team in Germany. So do I have the skills, the wherewithal to actually manage all of that? Right? Which requires a lot higher order thinking and, you know, EQ rather than just pure intellect. Mm, okay, so let me see what if I'm getting this is uh, that you're you're kind of making the case for why emotional intelligence and empathy is important, and yes. you're starting off by saying that uh, society, you know, before work environment was more of a hierarchical command and control uh, that you know factories and so forth. Uh, had that needed used that process, you know, for kind of efficiency. And as mm -hmm. we move from to uh, the development to now more of a creative economy, because there's more design and more creativity needed, that the creativity uh, mindset needs empathy and a sort of a sensitivity to it. So you're kind mm -hmm. of making the case that, hey, this is important because, uh, you know, moving from that control to, you know, creativity is going to need that, um, that uh, empathy. And then also, uh, you're also saying that uh, 
people are wanting to for knowing for a business or that the, the business is sort of ethical and that there's a mm-hmm. an ethics there that there's a sense of care i guess that for the business that they care about the the environment they care about other people so people are valuing that sense yeah. of care and so you right. need to be able to demonstrate that and empathy will help you demonstrate your sensitivity and your care and then with internationalization that there's a you're dealing with a lot of different cultures and a lot of different communication across dif- differences and you have to you have be empathic to have that communication between different cultures it's kind of what i'm hearing so far absolutely absolutely no, I, I think that, that that's a great summary yeah exactly that's what i'm trying to say you know there's on one hand there is a uh, surplus workforce, right? So you see, we hear a lot of automation. There is, uh, you know, jobs are going away. Um, it's become a reality in India as well. But at the same time, parallelly, we're hearing that there's a war for talent. It's almost like a paradox. How can you have lesser and less lesser jobs and yet have a war for talent? And and and, as, and what we argue is the reason for that is that uh, what is required more and more are people with higher 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 order thinking with some of these skills which were lacking so far Uh, because people are looking for companies are looking for people who can uh, like you just mentioned right how do you care for the planet how do you make it sustainable so this requires a much broader much more holistic thinking rather than the pure intellect operations driven stuff and that is why probably we feel that there is almost like this paradox on one hand we have lesser and lesser jobs yet the war for talent is not going away Mm, so the the newer jobs are needing people who have this higher order thinking, not just yeah. not just uh, good at command and control or or smart, but to have this emotional awareness and emotional sensitivity, and that those people are in the, in demand for these uh, newer jobs. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So if you, if we dig a little deeper in this. Um, there were these repetitive jobs, right? In the industrial revolution, there were, most of the jobs were repetitive and that's what brought in the command and control kind of style of management. Um, the work, the, the works, uh, breakdown was, there were fixed roles. There was a fixed role. People were hired for that role. Uh, the skills required were very specific. Um, but there the evolving need is automation and there a good system of control is the command and control. But as we get into jobs which are non-repetitive, which is what is happening, because what is repetitive is anyway, anyway getting automated. When we talk about jobs which are non-repetitive, there the job descriptions are much more open. They're much more dynamic. They're not fixed. What that also means is the skills required are more multidimensional, not specific skills. So they're multidimensional skills. It requires higher order thinking. And there, the kind of management that would work much better than a uh, command and control is really about empathy, is really, really about empowering and coaching. Mm-hmm. So the newer jobs is, uh, is to foster creativity and innovation, I guess, yes. is that you need to be able to support people and be sensitive to where they are and how you can sort of coach and move them forward. So you're, instead of just telling them what to do, you're sort of like a coach kind of seeing what their needs are and supporting them and moving, helping them move forward in their own creative uh, thinking and work. Exactly. And, and empathy yes. is a core of that because if you want to read somebody, if you, mm-hmm. you have to be able to empathize with them to even comprehend and see their problems or successes. You have to be able to be sensitive to that perception and that mm-hmm. requires empathy. Are they... Are they struggling? Are they succeeding? Or where is the struggle? So there's a sense of uh, empathic sensitivity needed uh, there. Mm-hmm. That's right. what I'm hearing so far. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then, then what I'm saying is let's look at what's happening within an organization. You know, the traditional organization versus uh, evolving organization or today's organization. And I've looked at it from different angles, you know, from a very traditional, um, traditional management style uh, of uh, looking at organizational structure. Or, uh, for instance, there were roles, responsibility, structure, power, authority, from all of these angles. Now, and I'll, I won't talk about all of them, but let, let me pick a few. So let's say roles. 
so ro what was earlier roles is more about people now. So people used to, early people were hired for a particular role. Today it's more about hiring a particular, uh, hiring a right person or hiring a good person and then trying to figure out what role to put that person in. So the focus is really about role, right? Rather the fo focus is on people rather than role. Responsibility is giving way to ownership. Responsibility is given, ownership is taken. So that's a, another fundamental shift that's happening. Um, earlier it was about authority because as a, as a leader, as a boss, you, you come in with authority and that's how you manage. Now it's more about influence. How are you able to influence? Um, manufacturing traditional was production, very production oriented. Today is about co-creation. Uh, what used to drive growth was incentives. What now is driving growth is passion. So the, the, what I'm arguing is if you look at some of these newer things, as opposed to the earlier way of looking at things, if you just look at these things, like if you look at these words, people, ownership, influence, co-creation, passion, they're all about people. They're all about human qualities rather than, uh, you know, we standard um, stuff like authority and department. So what we're really saying is that today everything is becoming more human oriented, more hu the human dimension is becoming more and more critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the human component, the, the, instead of the power over, so the power with and the, the yes. human aspect is what are the skills or the mindsets needed in the, in, the, in the new economy and those skills are really based on empathy. The, empathy, yes. Because we're talking about what is the, you know, what, who, is the, who are the other people, how are they, how am I, and that mm. uh, being sensitive to each other and yeah, to that human that humanity then right right okay um, then I talk about uh, another very interesting thing which is called the power paradox and uh, this I said the call really caught my attention it was uh, it was an article called the power trip uh, which which got published in the Wall Street Journal um, and I'll quick I'll just read out a couple of lines here it says studies show that a person may at one point exhibit all the qualities and attributes suitable for a position of leadership, power and trust. Yet on attaining a position of power over time, those very qualities get eroded. Empathy reduces, taken to an extreme, it can lead to, me it can lead to megalomania. But long before that, a sense of entitlement creeps in. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth in that. And we are seeing a lot of uh, big leaders. You know, there are companies where you're seeing uh, leaders who one would think that of course they had empathy which is why they became uh, you know the, the number one in these large companies but something happened after that right so they come with a sense of arrogance there's a lot of entitlement um, and this is probably explained very well by the power paradox which is that if you look at a cross-section of people people who are more senior in organization have higher empathy but it suddenly plummets when you're looking at people who are right at the top so something is happening there, and this is a very dangerous trend that's happening. Um, because if one is the right at the top and they're not showing empathy, then um, how does that company progress? How does that organization flourish? So, uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why uh, all leaders need to be very careful as to whether they're developing a sense of uh, entitlement and to be able to stay grounded and humble. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when people move up through the hierarchy, that uh, there comes a point where they, at the top, where they start losing their em sense of empathy. And I think there's been like studies about that at uh, like yeah. UC Berkeley, they, they okay. talk about that, that there's, I think the, the idea behind that is that as you get higher in position, you need to be less sensitive to get what you want, because you can do it through money or through power. So you get what you, you, you get your needs addressed and then you yeah. don't need to be empathic anymore to get yeah. your needs addressed. Whereas people who are, uh, you know, trying, they, they need to be more sensitive as they're kind of high, high, climbing the hierarchy. And then what I'm hearing is that as a leader, you need to be sensitive that that doesn't happen to you because of the, it's going to lead to negative consequences over time for the business or, Yes, yes, because that, that because uh, 
and that can percolate if there's arrogance at the top that can percolate down mm -hmm. okay so it's really about the arrogance that if you have yeah. then if the leadership becomes arrogant then it's going to have it's going to move through the whole hierarchy and cause problems and Those problems. so yeah so if you're in leadership maintain your empathy basically yeah uh-huh Okay. Um, then we've talked about um, a few stories. You know, there's one story that is a big one from India, which was a company uh, called Satyam. Uh, they were huge. Uh, the founder, who was uh, Ramalinga Raju, um, he had built up the, comp uh, the empire, you know, 50,000 employees over 50 countries. Um, he shocked the corporate world by coming out with a confession that uh, the company had falsified its accounts. And the extent of the fraud was about a one and a half billion dollars. This was quite quite a few years back. Um, so what's happening here, we feel, is that uh, a few things. One is that um, integrity involves self-regulation, right? Uh, an opportunity presents itself, and people with low impulse control are not able to say no. Uh, one thing leads to another, and before you know it, the whole thing snowballs into a huge disaster. It's very interesting when he said this, he came out with, in his own words, this was Raju's own words. He said, quote, it was like riding a tiger, not knowing how to get off without being eaten. And uh, what we are saying is, I mean, this is, this is again a very, very dangerous thing. So, and this actually happens because of lack of EQ, because of lack of impulse control. And then, you know, and we, we are seeing a lot, lot of those huge scandals which are unfolding. And probably the reason, the, the, one of the fundamental reasons is, um, you know, self -aware, lack of self-awareness, lack of empathy, which is actually causing all this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's kind of corruption happening, uh, deception yes. in, in businesses, and you're, you're kind of saying that that's caused by a lack of empathy, that that's, that, or emotional awareness or emotional intelligence is... Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, like we had here yeah. in the United States, Bernie Madoff, right? He was yeah. Yeah. had a fund and so forth. Well, one thing I did want to be sure that we left time. I've been very interested in how do we train and teach uh, empathy. Uh, so I want to be sure that we have some time to just kind of go through the different ways that you uh, see for training and teaching empathy. You're sort of making the case, you've been making the case like, hey, this is important, empathy is important. Right. So we have sort of like the, the, the why, right? We got, because, you know, if you want for well-being, uh, for the new economy, you know, for effective business, you know, we need uh, empathy and this emotional human intelligence. And what about the what, the how? Like, how do you develop it? I just want because yeah. we only we only have about twenty minutes. I want to be sure we cover that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've been starting to work on a on an online empathy training uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I'm very mm -hmm. much interested in how people are uh, doing the 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 skill building. Okay. Okay. So let me do you've this. Got, oh, you've got the motivation, right? It's like, yeah, I want to be more empathic for my company. I, you've convinced me. Like, how do I yeah. do it? Now? How do I do it? Okay. <laughs> sure. So let let me do this. Let me quickly kind of jump to that that part. So I was in okay. chapter three. Um, very quickly, chapter four talks about. Uh, it's a very specific chapter on millennials. It says, how do you manage the millennials? And what we're talking about is. Uh, how is millennial changing the workplace or are they really changing it? Are they really different? Because there's always been a generation gap. How is it different now? Right. So that the chapter is more around that because mm -hmm. this is something that's very real. 50% of the workforce in India is all are, are millennials oh, wow. and conflict in terms of the so-called oldies don't know how to manage the millennials. And you know, there's, there's a, there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. Chapter five, I talk about, it's called from STEM to esteem. And essentially, <clears throat> what we are saying is there's a lot of focus on this, the so-called STEM, the science, technology, engineering, maths, uh, in, globally, as well as in India. There's a lot of focus there. Uh, but what we are saying is that what, what we are proposing is that it needs to be, STEM is fine, but what we need, what is called emotional enablement on top of that. And that's why uh, we, we coined this word called esteem, where this double E stands for emotional enablement. Okay. We go on to define what what that really means 
uh, in terms of emotional enablement. And it's, it's, it's a lifelong journey. It's not something that you just pick a skill and do it. It's really in that, in that, um, in that theory of framework of learning. It's really about how to move from uh, conscious competence to unconscious competence, where it really becomes second nature. Right. So that's, that's, and then I go on to actually talk a little bit about the EQ framework, which Daniel Goldman talks about in terms of the two by two quadrant where he talks about personal competence and social competence. And then uh, what we are saying is all that is fine, but what do we do about it to your question? So how do we yeah. do about it? What we have done is we've created, uh, we've come up with four uh, so-called states of being. What we are saying is that we need to be those things in order to actually move the needle in terms of EQ. So those four are being mindful, being realistic, being reflective, and being empathetic. So those are the four states of being, and there are chapters um, six through eight um, is actually talking about, each of the chapters talks about uh, one of these states of being. Mm -hmm. And is it so how to develop, because you're talking about a state of being, right? That's like an emotional state of being, and how do you develop that? Like, oh, how yeah. do you, yes. it's kind of the skill building, the practices of, of that. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. So the chapter actually talks a lot about that particular skill. What does it mean? Why is it important? And how do you build that? Right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'll start with the first one, which is the chapter six, which is called Being Mindful, Alive and in the Moment. So what we are saying is that... Um, being mindful actually is, goes to the core of, 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 of developing EQ, right? Which is really to that Goldman's model is more about the self-awareness thing, you know, that kind of um, maps very well there. So I had a, I had a, I remember in my last job, I had a boss who used to, uh, he was not my direct boss, but he was a senior person in the company and he would turn up in meetings and uh, looking very drained. And we would have these team meetings every week and he would come in drained. Often he wouldn't come. And then when he did, he would come in late and he said he would announce to everybody they hadn't slept for the last few days, last three days and uh, taking care of an escalation. Right. And, you know, people almost wear this as a badge of honor. I mean, it's like, you know, he would expect people to be saying, oh, wow, I mean, you're so, you're so great. And uh, the, the, the message that's going out to everybody is if I can work so hard, why can't you? Right. And what we're saying is this is uh, something which is um, detrimental to building motivation, to building empathy, right? Um, most of us live in autopilot. So, and there's a lot of statistics on that in terms of, you know, uh, if you're not mindful, if you're doing things mindlessly, that often we are, you know, uh, doing and uh, thinking of two different things. In the statistics show it's as high as 50%, 47%. Uh, so what is mindfulness, right? And what, what you know, um, we have a bias for action and the, which actually prevents us from thinking, reflecting and, and, and taking the right steps, right? So we tend, tend to jump into things. And in order to explain that, we, I talk about, uh, you know, a little bit about the neuroscience and I've tried to make it very simple in terms of understanding, you know, how the brain develop, uh, you know, the, the, the emotional brain, the mammalian brain, the reptilian brain, all of that and uh, the amygdala hijack, if you will, which is basically, uh, you know, where, where you're not thinking, um, you know, the, the brain sees a threat and then automatically it, it kind of um, gets into what is called the fight or flight syndrome. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so then we get a, and, and it's happened to a lot of us. It's happened to many of us. And you, you think back, there have been times that we've lost our cool, we got into road rage, we snapped at a colleague or maybe even to a boss only to regret it later saying, what was I thinking? And chances are we, aren't, we weren't thinking because that uh, connection was not there to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so what do we do about it? So the, I think the key thing would be to avoid uh, uh, a, a hijack kind of situation. And this hijack can be an intense one um, or it can be even a very subtle one. Uh, you know, somebody just talks loudly in a meeting and we've seen that. Um, and somebody gets, gets very aggressive, which he, you know, normally person is not very aggressive. Uh, he gets very aggressive and, and starts, starts raising his voice or he gets into a shell and completely uh, keeps quiet. And that's very detrimental because, you know, thereafter they, the entire team misses out on the inputs from this person. Essentially, the first one was about taking a fight. Uh, this thing he's in the fight mode. The second one he's in a flight mode. 
Now, this is not something very intense, but still some of those biological things which are happening uh, keep happening. You know, the, the stress hormones are getting released. You know, he, 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 he's got a, you know, his pitch is higher, his, his palms are sweating, he has butterflies in his stomach, all of that. So essentially, it's, it's a milder form of, threat of, of, the, uh, of the hijack that's happening. Right. So what we need to do, I think the fundamental thing, the key thing that we have to do in order to control ourselves is to avoid this hijack. So in terms of understanding, in terms of understanding that, yes, we are, uh, um, for instance, if I'm getting angry, the understanding that, yes, I am getting angry to be able to tag that emotion mm -hmm. and saying, yes, even if I can understand that I'm getting angry, I mean, that's, I think, how the battle won. Right. And that requires a lot of practice. And um, I have personally seen that happening with me. It's, it's, I have had hijack situations a lot when I was working and over the years I have, I have worked on it and it's something that people can develop. And uh, it, I think it, it has helped me to improve. In, it has helped me in kinds of being more mindful um, and avoid such situations because, you know, and one moment of, uh, uh, of, of uh, what's the right word? Uh, you know, one incident like that, and then we can repent it and repent later. Mm -hmm. but okay, so there's, there's uh, you can come up with these emotions like fear or anger. Yeah. And right. you're saying that uh, understanding or mm -hmm. even just being aware of those feelings and naming them is yes. something that kind of creates space around those feelings. And, and so being able to name the feelings as they arrive creates... Uh, keeps those feelings from hijacking your full consciousness in a, in a sense. Yes. And, and then you yes. personally had experiences with that and that yes. there's these times when you get all angry and just one blow up of anger can have a lot of, you know, a, a lot of consequences that we may regret after the fact. So and you've personally experienced that as well yes. and you've been working on that personally too. So you have a personal connection with that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, then I talk about uh, mindfulness and meditation. So mindfulness meditation. Um, and this is very interesting because I see here that both, you know, there is uh, the Eastern influence as well as the Western influence and they're kind of converging here. Right. Uh, if you go back to the time of, you know, in our Hinduism, these, these things of yoga meditation was always there. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, inputs from the Western world itself. I talk about, uh, you know, Kabat Zen who actually kind of try to demystify it. So he came up with this definition of mindfulness. Because we do a lot of training to the corporates, um, I see a lot of reluctance in picking up anything that is seen as a little bit spiritual. And this I actually talk about my own experience again. I was not into meditation, uh, but, my, but my colleague, my founder, my ex-colleague, I have seen it work with him. Um, and uh, it's done wonders to him as well as to me. And I've, I've, I've uh, turned to meditation. I've, I've read up a lot. And I, I'm, what, what I'm essentially arguing is, hey, this could be one of the, the greatest things which can actually help you be more mindful. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's very scientific. And I actually talk a lot about the science part of it because it's essentially about not trying to curb the thoughts. It's essentially about uh, observing the thoughts. So when we're meditating, you know, we keep, getting a lot of thoughts in our mind, but observing them, but also getting our focus back, the recentering based on the breathing. So essentially, and that helps us to build focus in meditation. There's a lot of studies which are actually showing that, um, um, you know, meditation does help in, in terms of, uh, on multiple on multiple fronts, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's lowering pressure, lowering of stress, all of that. So I talk a lot about the science behind it. Um, you know, what happens to the brain activity during meditation. Um, and it's very interesting because uh, we talked about labeling emotions. It's through fMRI studies there, one can see that labeling emotions actually reduces the, the intensity uh, that is observed in the amygdala. And in fact, mindfulness, uh, a program of eight, eight weeks has shown to actually reduce this, uh, has actually shown to shrink the amygdala. So obviously something is happening out there, uh, which can be very well scientifically explained. Okay, so you've got the mindfulness is another way of uh, building these skills, and and it's about uh, just allowing the feelings to come up, yes, and kind of being present with it. And then there's yes. the breathing part to get uh, gets back into your body, you know, be 
and being sensitive to the felt experience that you have to do the breathing and reconnect with your with your body and so you know, maybe help with grounding and so forth. Right, right, right. Since we only have about 10 minutes left, should we jump? We did the mindfulness. Do you want to jump forward to the empathy? Uh, you had four, I think. Uh, yes, I had four. So uh, let mm -hmm. me jump to the empathy and then we'll come back to the other two, which is uh, realistic okay. and reflective if time comes. Okay. Uh -huh. So uh, empathy is interesting. Of the four, uh, the other three are more internally directed. So if I'm talking about, you know, I need to be more mindful. I need to be more realistic. I need to be more reflective. It's more about me, but empathy is not really about me. It's about us, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's about it's externally directed. To that extent, it's, it's very interesting. It's different. Um, when one does a search on empathy, it's, in, it's mind boggling. I just did a search today. I came up with 72 million results on Google and almost a million results on YouTube. And fascinating that there are a million videos out there in empathy. So obviously there is a lot of interest in empathy. But what I've also done while read, writing the book is ask different people what they mean by empathy. And uh, everybody has their own definition of what empathy is, right? Um, and some of these words like compassion, empathy, all of that, they tend to get in, uh, interchangeably used, uh, even though there are uh, uh, differences between them, right? Um, then I talk a lot about uh, the sympathy versus empathy, right? So what is, what is really the difference uh, between the two? Because again, these two words get used very interchangeably. And I've, I've talked of a story uh, where I was driving down and, I, and this person, it was a red light, and this person came and started uh, se selling a box of tissues. It's a, I don't know if you've been to India, when mm -hmm. I have on site here, right? So you have uh -huh. the traffic lights, there'll be people trying to sell you something. Right, they're just trying to make uh, make a living, um, and I've talked about. I won't get into the details, but essentially, what would be a sympathetic response response versus an empathetic response in such a situation? And I've taken multiple situations. Right, um, essentially, in sympathy, we try to make uh, we we try to improve the situation. You know, we say things like, "Hey, don't feel bad," or we try to be judgmental. Hey, you shouldn't feel bad, right? Uh, but a response typically doesn't make it better. What makes it better is connection. And that's where empathy is much deeper. Right? Empathy, empathy need not give a suggestion, need not give a solution, but it's, it's deeper in terms of forging connections. So for instance, somebody says, I had a terrible day, day and I'm feeling miserable. And my sympathetic response could be, oh, just forget about it. Let's go and have a cup of coffee or let's go and eat something. That's a very sympathetic, uh, sympathetic response. Whereas an empathetic response would, would be, Okay, would you like to share what happened, right? So not that I'm giving a solution, but actually that's what, it's about caring, it's about connection. Uh, so empathy goes deeper. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are more examples in the book where I talk about, you know, how that's different from, so, from the others, right? So you're making the differences between different types of responses, like an empathic yeah. response and then the blocks, be it sympathy or... Or you'd mentioned yeah. some others before, you know, the right. attachment or trying to grab the attention for yourself. So you're kind of making the different types of responses sh showing, uh, yes. kind of explaining what an empathic response would be versus these other sort of empathy blocking responses. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. correct. Do you have like uh, practices that you do, like exercises that you're doing for practicing that? Uh, like one thing we do, we have something called an empathy circle where we get mm -hmm. small groups of, you know, two, three, four, five people, and we do mutual empathic listening practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we do reflective listening. Uh, yeah. This is a good starting point and then, you know, go into other, you know, kind of build on that. But that seems to be a real good uh, foundation. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I saw some videos that was very interesting. What we do is something called uh, how to listen better. And then, then we do some uh, exercises around that. Okay. So there are some do's and don'ts of, uh, of empathetic listening and active listening. And uh, once we give the concepts out, we actually have people do role plays and try to see are they really listening. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be as simple as, um, you know, uh, you cannot respond till you paraphrase what the other person has said, right? Um, and, and that can actually help in terms of one, it ensures that the person is actually listening fully to what the person is saying, 
because often we we kind of somewhere in between we shut off and we start thinking what to how to respond and thinking of a rebuttal. So we right. can avoid. Yeah. That. Are you uh, teaching these skills? Is that what your your you have a book about uh, emotional intelligence and you're like you have a is your company teaching those skills or is that what the company is? It's a sort of a corporate uh, training. Yes, that's okay. correct. We do corporate training, coaching, and consulting. Okay, and is it you and the, the co-author, or who who is the, who's in the company? And um... no, my co-author is not with my company. Okay. My company uh -huh. has been formed by two other people who are my ex-colleagues from Philips. Uh -huh. uh, so three of us run the company. We have a shared passion of of these leadership skills, uh, uh -huh. and there we talk not just about emotional intelligence or or empathy. Uh, as I was saying earlier, it is about wellness. We talk about mindset we talk about trust we talk about conflict um, so all of those things including uh, some stuff like design thinking uh, problem solving decision making mm -hmm. are you so you're teaching design thinking too or yes yes oh, okay so it's really it's a oh sorry the, the book is sort of a blueprint i guess for your for what, what you're teaching then uh -huh. yes on the in that area yeah oh, okay well, how is the demand for that in, in India? Is this in India or are you doing it in other places too, other countries? Uh, well, the, it's primarily in India. The, mm -hmm. the, uh, the training we're doing primarily in India, uh, even though we, we, have some, uh, we have some queries from outside and we might ex uh, venture out uh, globally, but right now it's, it's in India. Okay, and how's the demand for in India for this kind of uh, this kind of thinking or these kind of values um, difficult to say it I think it lot depends on the on the leadership uh, some companies feel it's very important um, a lot of the demand comes from companies which are multinationals which have a global presence mm -hmm. uh, so tend to uh, kind of put more value on, on some of these softer aspects um, yeah so yeah and we started more on the softer part, on the more on the non-cognitive parts, but because sometimes com companies want more of the, the so-called hard skills, that's when we started looking at uh, things like, um, uh, you know, problem solving, decision making, delegation, design thinking, which are re really a little more kind of concrete, a little mm -hmm. more, you know, tangible. If well, you with, uh, if you're looking at human-centered design or design thinking, it's at least yeah. uh, with the... Uh, you know, IDEO, you know, the D school, Stanford D school model, empathy is a very, you know, clear and big component. It's the gateway, it's the first step. So, yeah. and I guess there's a, if, if a companies are wanting to implement design thinking, they've, you know, they need to uh, look at the whole uh, empathy component. How are they gonna yes. empathize with the needs of the people they're designing for? And um, so I would imagine that would, it's yeah, so that a draw that, for companies. Uh -huh. Exactly, and that's exactly what's happening. Companies are, they're not saying give us training on empathy, but when they're saying give us training on design thinking, and suddenly we're talking user empathy, we're talking cust empathy maps and journey maps, mm -hmm. and the eye opener. Oh, okay, we didn't know this, uh, this thing, so it's interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's how they're getting introduced to the concept of. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, then I think our time is up. Uh, we've gone for an hour. It's gone quite quickly. Do you have a copy of the book there in front I do. of you? I do. Maybe you could just hold it up. It's right here. Uh, yeah, a little bit closer to the camera. Great. So the, the book is uh, a Command to Empathy uh, Using EQ in the Age of Disruption. So uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights. It, it's wonderful to hear about what's going on in India and you know, how empathy is getting a, you know, a foothold or toehold in, in the business world in empathy, I mean, in, in India. So uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, this with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edwin.